We now move on to questions to the Minister for Infrastructure. And uh, just before I do so, can I welcome Mr Hazard to his first question time. Call Mr George Robinson. A proposal to provide a climbing lane on the A37 Broad Road at Gorkobies between Limavati and Colerain has been developed by, by my department. This project envisages the construction of a new road just to the north of the existing road to deliver a 2.4 km length of climbing lane, providing a positive overtaking opportunity which would reduce queues and the potential for collisions caused by driver frustration. The scheme would complement the existing lane on the Coleraine side of the mountain. As the House will be aware, all capital road improvement schemes must compete for funding alongside other executive priorities. I must therefore prioritise spending on those areas with the greatest need. My department remains committed to improving connections for people and goods and services, and I have already stated my commitment to two of the executive's flagship projects to improve road connections to the North West. As such, my department is pressing ahead with the plans for duelling of parts of the A6 and duelling of the A5. There is currently no funding available for this project. However, a climbing lane at this location has its benefits and will therefore be considered for further should further funding become available. Well, Mr Robinson, for a supplementary. Um, thank the Minister for his response, uh, which sounds fairly positive. But, um, as this is a vital tourist and economic road link between London, Derry, Limavady and the North Coast with road accident poten and with road accident potential, would the Minister try and prioritise this stretch of road for the provision of a climbing lane when roads funds becomes available? I know money is short, but it is very, very essential that this part, part of the road uh, would be upgraded. And I thank the member for the supplementary. Uh, as the member will know, the scheme looks to provide more than 2.4 kilometres uh, of overtaken opportunity. I'm led to believe by officials, having looked at the road, that this may be possible without going for the full extent of the scheme, uh, as outlined previously in plans. So it's something that we're prepared to have a look at, because as the member is right, uh, there are obvious opportunities and benefits from a scheme like this to that area. Call Mr. Jerry Mullen. And thank the Minister for his answers thus far. And as Mr Robinson has already stated, the A37 is a major transport corridor for the North West. And after many years of delay, will the Minister give assurances that his, this scheme, as well as the Dungiven Bypass, will progress in this mandate? Minister. Thank you, and I thank the member for his question. Uh, I can certainly give uh, guarantees that the Dungiven Bypass, as with the Julian Works in the A6, remains a priority for myself and my department in this mandate. Uh, as I have outlined to, to Mr Robinson, this particular project, uh, the, the money is not there at this particular time to do it, but there may be other engineering solutions that we are prepared to look at. Call Ms Linda Dillon. Question number two. Work on the construction of Maherfeld Bypass began in May 2015, and whilst progress on the bypass was initially hindered by inclement weather after construction began in May 2015, the recent spell of good weather has been timely and has enabled the earthworks element of the works to be completed. The overbridges and drainage are, are also now almost complete, and the side roads have been reopened to traffic. Pavement construction is now well underway, and approximately 30 per cent of the carriageway has now been laid. Work to create the new roundabouts at Moneymore Road and Ockram Road are nearing completion, and commence commencement of work on a new roundabout at the Ballyronan Road is scheduled to commence in July. It is anticipated that the new road will reopen to traffic in October 2016. Ms Dillon for a supplementary. I would like to thank the Minister for his answer and also to welcome him here to his first question time. Can I ask the Minister? to give an indication of when construction will commence on the Randallstown to Castle Dawson section of the A6. And I thank the member for her kind words. We, we are taking on two major duelling projects on the A6, the Randallstown to Castle Dawson scheme and the Derry to the Given scheme. The 15-kilometre Randallstown to Castle Dawson scheme comprises two sections of dual carriageway either side of the Tomb Bypass. Detailed design is ongoing as are discussions with the appointed contractors regarding agreeing a target cost. 
subject to satisfactory conclusion of these discussions and DOF approval of the business case, construction should get underway in the late summer 2016. Call Mr. Trevor Lunn. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, uh, the Minister will be aware of the many promises that were made by his predecessor and before the election, of course, in, in terms of major road projects. Uh, he seems to be saying the same thing now, that uh, it's as and when money becomes available. But can he, can he give us any idea of timescale for any of these major projects? I know he's just given us one for Randallstown and so on. I thank the member for, for his question. Uh, and he's alluded to the tight e economic times in, in which we operate. Uh, and despite the fact that we have a number of very worthwhile projects in planning process and going through different stages and sitting at different stages, inevitably it will all come down to hard cash and, and to our ability to deliver some of these. Uh, I've outlined already that the work, construction work on the A6 uh, is due to commence later this year in the summer. Uh, I, I hope that construction on the A5 following the plan appeals inquiry will begin a similar time next year. Um, the Maher Felt Bypass is just nearing completion. So there are a number of large uh, road schemes that are taking place uh, and will continue to take place as monies do become available. Before we move on, I must inform the House that uh, question number three and question number 13 have been withdrawn. Call Mr. Steve Aiken. Question number four. As the member will be aware, at the end of last year, the 133 million A8 duelling scheme between Belfast and Larne was completed, which represented one of the largest investments in the roads infrastructure in the north in recent years. I am also pleased to confirm plans to resurface the A8 between Corps Corner Roundabout and Houston's Corner Roundabout on the outskirts of Newton Abbey. The scheme is expected to cost in the region of £900,000 and will include an overlay of the existing carriageway and the creation of a new pedestrian and cycle path on the southbound side that will link into the National Cycle Network. The scheme is currently out to tender and is expected to commence on site later in the summer. I can also confirm plans to invest £130,000 in local transport and safety measures in the South Antrim area this financial year, which will include the provision of new puffin crossing facilities at Mossley Primary School and Ballynure Road, Ballyclare, and a collision remedial scheme at Doak Road, Newton Abbey. Looking ahead, plans are currently being prepared for the upgrade of the Doak Road Station Road O'Neill Road Junction at Clock Fern in Newton Abbey, the widening of the Manse Road between Prince William Way and Carmoni Road North, the widening of the Hyde Park Road in the vicinity of Bog Hill Road, and provision of a footway on Carnt Hill Road, all in Newton Abbey, and provision of a footway at the Shore Road Tomb. Details of all the work being carried out by Transport NI in the Mid and East Antrim area can be found on Transport NI's annual report to the Mid and East Antrim Borough Council, which is now available on the departmental website. Call Mr. Aiken for a supplementary. Uh, may I thank the Minister and uh, welcome him to the Assembly and giving his, uh, his answer to that. And thank you very much indeed for that uh, detailed description of what we're looking to do in South Antrim, for which my and my constituents thank you. But the question I would look to ask is whether the Minister and the Minister of Finance could look at innovative financing arrangements for the much needed Ballyclare Relief Road, a new bridge over the Six Mile River. Uh, Ballyclare is in a position quite unlike some places in Northern Ireland where it's growing and it's growing fast. And we need to be able to support the people of Ballyclare and to actually improve the social well-being of South Antrim and also to work significantly to improve the economy in that area as well. I thank the member for supplementary and indeed for his kind words. Uh, and I think it's important that all ministers, especially in the light of the decision that was taken last week, do be innovative uh, and do start to think outside of the box when we look at funding arrangements. The Ballyclare Bypass, or the Western Relief Road, has been identified in the Belfast Metropolitan Transport Plan as being required to support de development proposals in the area. Therefore, it is termed as a developer-driven road, and it is the responsibility of developers to build it. As such, the Ballyclare Relief Road will not be funded from the public purse, and it is not programmed for delivery by my department. Well, Mr. Paul Garvin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank the Minister for his answers thus far uh, and the, the, the list of projects that are underway. I want to come back to the Ballyclare Relief Road issue uh, and on the understanding that we know that other mechanisms exist elsewhere, not maybe in this jurisdiction, but elsewhere where the public can access, the department can access funding 
and deliver the road and draw it back over a period of time. Is that something that the Minister would, if possible, look at? I thank the member for his supplementary, uh, and as outlined uh, in my previous answer, I am more than happy to, to meet with the member, indeed any members, who, who do have innovative ideas and approaches to this situation. Uh, our, our options, I think, going forward may be limited, uh, especially in light of some of the places where we might be able to go to look for alternative finance on the, on the back of decisions last week. Uh, but, as I have said at the outline of this, I am more than happy to sit down with the member and discuss some of these ideas. Well, Mr. Declan Kearney. Thank you, Speaker, and may I wish the new Minister best wishes in his uh, future portfolio. Can I bring to the Minister's attention the serious road safety concerns that obtain on Glenavy uh, Main Street and the nearby Glen and uh, Chapel Roads, and ask that his department would undertake the necessary surveys which would be required to allow for urgent remedial works to be undertaken. Gormaigat. Gormaigat, and can I thank the member for his supplementary? Some of the safety measures that I, that I outlined uh, in my initial answer to Mr. Aiken uh, included some of these measures, such as the Puffin Crossing uh, at Mosley Primary School, the Puffin Crossing at Ballynure Road, Ballyclare, traffic camming measures in Avondale Drive, Ballyclare, collision remedial scheme on the Doak Road and general traffic management measures such as pedestrian refuge, footway upgrades, bus measures, traffic signal upgrades. Uh, I am not aware of the particular issue the member has raised, but again, like others, I am more than happy to sit down with the member to discuss some of these concerns. Well, Mr. Jim Wells. Question number five, Mr. Speaker. Well done, Jim. I like the way A significant amount of work has been completed on the A24 Balnehinch bypass to progress the scheme through the preliminary options, preferred option and proposed option scheme assessments. This work enabled publication of the environmental statement, draft direction and draft vesting orders in March 2015. The former Department for Regional Development received a number of objections during the statutory consultation period for the draft orders and it was determined appropriate to convene a public inquiry to examine the case for and against the proposed scheme. The inquiry was held on the 26th and 27th of January this year. The inspector's report of the inquiry was subsequently received in March 2016, and my department's Transport NI project development team have considered the report and recommendations contained, and are currently preparing a report for my consideration later this year. Subject to a satisfactory outcome, my department will publish the environmental statement notice of intention to proceed and make the direction, or of direction order for the proposed scheme. Call Mr. Wells for supplementary. He of all ministers knows the importance of the Balnehinch Bypass. Like myself, he's been stuck in Balnehinch far too many times. Can he give the House a commitment that he will be cutting the, cutting the ribbon on the newly opened Balnehinch Bypass within his five-year term? I thank the member uh, for his question, uh, and perhaps like the member uh, as local MLAs, we know the back roads to avoid the congestion in Balnehinch town itself. Uh, that's not to suggest that it isn't a significant priority for my department. And whilst it's not a flagship project, I think it's very, very important uh, in not only tackling congestion in Balnehinch town, but entering into the, to the wider South Down area. Uh, and I remain committed to see this project through, so that has, if, if funds do become available, we should be able to progress with it. Before I call Ms Armstrong, I remind the member that this is a, this is a constituency specific question, therefore expect the question to be constituency specific. Thank you. As, a, as the MLA for Strangford, where Balna Hinch is, I certainly will stick within my constituency. Um, it's not just an important point for crossing or for people getting through Balna Hinch, but I've also had quite a number of people who are concerned about the road safety on the Belfast Road in particular, where you have Assumption Grammar and quite a lot of elderly residents living along that part of the road. Has the Minister's um, considerations following the public inquiry um, anything to crossing for that part of the road, given the fact that it is so dangerous? I thank the member uh, for her supplementary, uh, and I am indeed, indeed, as a local person, well aware of the, the road safety concerns indeed inside the town for some pedestrians in recent years and indeed uh, outside. Road safety is paramount for my department, and going forward, any such plans will take that into consideration. Call Ms. Joanne Dobson. 
Mr. Speaker, question number six. The provision of grass cutting services, along with many other routine maintenance activities, has been adversely affected not only by budgetary constraints in my department over the last two years, but as a result of our economic climate uh, as a behest of Tory ministers in London. As members will appreciate, the provision of all public services depends on the availability of funding. The restoration of grass cutting and other maintenance activities to normal levels ultimately depends on the available budget. I am pleased to say that as a result of Finance Minister's announcement of additional resource allocation as part of the June monitoring round, an additional grass cut across all areas will now be undertaken. This means that the rural grass verges will be cut twice this year. Grass cutting operations carried out by my department are for road safety reasons and not for cosmetic or amenity purposes. I fully realise that the reduced level of service has had a significant impact on the appearance of our towns and villages and across the road network generally. I hope members will welcome the restoration of the second grass cut in rural areas. However, within the funding envelope available, it is not possible to reinstate five cuts per year in urban areas. Although I do, not, although I do note the welcome intervention of some local councils to maintain grass in urban areas, I am determined to ensure my department delivers an acceptable level of routine maintenance services, and I look forward to continuing positive engagement with executive colleagues to secure the necessary funding. Ms. Dobson, first supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I thank the Minister for his answer? He will be aware that this issue is one which has been raising, if he excuses the pun, growing concerns from motorists every year. Would the Minister agree with me that a closer working relationship between Transport NI and local councils could lead to a better response to grass cutting next year? And will he instigate this new working relationship? I thank the member for a supplementary question. Uh, and to a large extent, there, there are work behind the scenes uh, that do take place between my department and other agencies uh, in looking after this. And I know local councils sometimes do get involved in the amenity areas. Uh, and that's something that I'm more than happy to look at and to extend going into the future. Well, Mr. Mervyn, story. Can I welcome the Minister to his first question time? And clearly proves that being a member of the Education Committee is very advantageous. Uh, the Minister will be well aware of the concerns that have been raised uh, in regards to the issue of the grass cutting. Given the collaboration that there is with gritting during the winter time and local farmers in terms of using them as a means of delivering a service, will the Minister give consideration to expanding that relationship with local farmers in rural areas where they could become a very valuable asset in terms of the rural community, hence freeing up the facility to ensure that the urban uh, network is maintained in a way that is safe and in a way that we all would like to see it return to? I thank the member for his supplementary and indeed for his good stewardship through the Education Committee while he was chair. Um, yes, absolutely. I'm very much prepared to, to work with anybody who, who, who can who can help us in this regard. Uh, we know that the farming and rural community came to great aid during the recent winter storms uh, when snow blighted areas such as myself in South Down uh, and farmers basically came to the rescue in times whenever they were needed. So I know I am due to meet farming representatives over the next few months and that will certainly be on the agenda. Call Ms. Jennifer McCann. Can I, can I just uh, also uh, welcome the Minister to his first question time and you know, ask the Minister I know that grass cutting has been a big issue both in urban and rural areas, but can I ask the Minister, can he outline what effect the June monitoring will have on all other areas of road maintenance? And I know that, um, does the Minister believe that departments working together across departmental in that way would, would actually help us? I thank the member uh, for supplementary. Um, as a result of the outcome of June monitoring, Transport and I has been allocated five million to enhance routine maintenance services in a number of areas. Not only will a second grass cut happen everywhere, um, despite the fact that it was only once last year and not at all the year before. In addition, the majority of potholes will now be repaired and the renewal of road markings will be accelerated. An additional gully clean will also be programmed in all urban areas and the repair of street lighting outages will continue well past the autumn. Weed spraying, none of which was done last year, will also begin again this year. Oh, Mr. Chris Little. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the Minister for his update. Can I ask him what impact the additional finance secured by his department will have on grass cutting in our capital city, uh, Belfast City Council area? I thank the member for his supplementary uh, and his outline to previous speakers. 
Uh, the additional finances are going to enable us to have a second cut right across the network, which includes the capital city, as the member put it. I call Mr. David Ford. Seven. The priorities for investment in our rail network over the next 20 years are contained in the Railway Investment Prioritisation Strategy, which was consulted upon and published in 2014. While the strategy contains a commitment to explore the potential for establishing a rail link to Belfast International Airport, it was estimated that annual passenger numbers would need to rise to around 10 million to make a rail link economically viable and to enable provision of a regular and frequent service. Passengers throughout 2015 totaled 4.4 million. A network utilisation strategy developed by TransLink more recently sets a detailed cost and timetable of potential investment reflecting this strategic decision. The document identifies possible future new network connections, including reopening the line between Antrim and Knockmore via Crumlin. However, the document suggests that reopening the line is considered a long-term option only. Mr Ford, first supplementary. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I also would wish to welcome the Minister to his first question time and thank him for his response. But given that it's now in excess of 20 years ago since I discussed the reopening of the Knockmore line with a senior TransLink engineer, could he ask whether he can hold out any hope for my constituents in Crumlin and Glenavy that we see something a bit more satisfactory than the 109A bus service, even if it were done on a limited and experimental basis using the existing line? I, I thank the member for his supplementary and for his welcome words. Uh, to reopen services on the Knockmore to Antrim line, TransLink would need to completely re-signal the line re-rail it with continuous welded rail, upgrade 23 user work crossings, completely refurbish the halts, and depending on the timetable operated, potentially reinstate a passing loop. It is difficult to cost this work without undertaking a full feasibility study. However, provisionally TransLink estimate the cost would be in the region of up to £100 million. Without the, the relevant passenger numbers, I don't know if this would reflect best value for money. Can I call Mr. Fran McCann, please? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, thank the, the, the Minister for his uh, question. But I think he's partially answered uh, the question that I was going to ask. Uh, but does he see it, foresee a time when the real link to Belfast International uh, would become viable? I, th I thank the member for his supplementary. Uh, and as I suppose I have outlined to, to Mr Ford, uh, I think the onus here has to be on increasing the passenger capacity of the rail network uh, before we can perhaps look uh, at reopening the line. Paul, Mr Mark Durgan. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answers thus far. I'm sure the Minister does appreciate the importance of rail connectivity with our airports in terms of developing our economy, both through business and uh, tourism. In light of this, I, I'd like to ask the Minister if he has any plans to look at the prospect of establishing a rail halt at uh, City of Derry Airport. I thank the member for the question. Uh, it would be remiss of me not to consider it in the future now that he has raised it. But uh, I, I think we should break away from the fact that to be successful, we need to have a real halt in an airport. Uh, Dublin Airport has expanded massively in recent years and, and is a good success. However, it does not have a, a real halt. Uh, I think public transport is very, very important. We have, TransLink have a strong uh, bus network that services many of our airports. And as passenger numbers remain as they are presently, I think that's probably the best way forward for now. Can I just remind members that when a question, the initial question is a constituency specific question, that it's incumbent upon members to keep their supplementary questions uh, pertinent to that constituency question. Ms. Gildernew is not in her place. I call Mr. Jonathan Bell. I am very aware of the issues relating to coastal erosion and coastal management, not just in the Strangford constituency, but across the whole coastline of the north. There is clearly a need to tackle these issues in a more strategic way than has been the case up to now, and I will be playing my part to help achieve that. I would like to commend the work of the Ards Peninsula Coastal Erosion Group and the members' constituency in raising the profile of these important issues. And I can advise the member that my department's Transport and I has recently carried out a survey of the Ards Peninsula coastline to assess the impact of coastal erosion on sea walls and verges adjacent to the carriageway. While the results of this survey have yet not been finalised, 
it is anticipated that they will provide a clearer picture on the extent of investment required to carry out proactive repairs in order to prevent incidents such as road collapses in the future. The survey will help to inform the necessary financial planning and prioritisation of the required works. Well, Mr. Bell, for supplementary. Thank you very much, and can I welcome the minister to his post and welcome his uh, interest and also his positive comments uh, about the ARGE group that are looking at it and the many individuals uh, that are along that group. Can the minister give us an idea when that survey will be finalised and when he would be in a position to come to the House with a timeline and action plan to address what is in it? I thank the member for his supplementary question, indeed his uh, kind remarks. Uh, I, I, I do not know when the survey will be complete. Uh, I expect it is sometime later this year. Uh, but it is something that, as a uh, member for the constituency of South Down and someone who has worked on the need to enhance and protect our coastline uh, to date, I will be taken very seriously. Uh, I have had initial discussions with uh, the Deira Minister, Michelle McElveen, I, I know a, colleague, a constituency colleague of yours also in that part of the world, and it is something that we are keen to work on together uh, as coastal erosion and the problems and the need for innovative and strategic solutions to those problems becomes a bigger problem every day. Call Ms. Kelly Armstrong. Thank you, Minister, for your quite positive um, remarks. Just to ask, the, the survey, as far as I was aware, was a, a, a road survey that was being completed, and I think it, so far there had been something like 68 or 69 points along that road survey that indicated that there had been there were problems there that would need to be addressed. But um, just going back to the coastal erosion issue, the coastal erosion issue is more about maintenance. Um, on a long-term basis, the preventative measures, will that be taken into consideration in this survey? I thank the member for supplementary and indeed her interest and in work uh, on this particular issue. I know it is an issue as close to her heart. Uh, well, I, I think I can give a guarantee that if th those issues are not in the survey, it's something that we certainly want to look at afterwards. Uh, as I've outlined previously, solutions and innovative solutions are going to have to be part of this. I know there are research and development projects into uh, how tires, for example, can be used uh, in coastal erosion. Uh, the planting of specific plants along our coastline can also play a very important role. So, uh, if those solutions are not included in the survey, it's certainly a piece of work that I'd be keen to do in the run-up afterwards. Call Mr. Roy Beggs. <coughs> Question number 10. I have allocated half a million pounds of the additional resource funding which my department received in the June monitoring round in order to bolster my department's street lighting and maintenance service. This new allocation is in addition to the initial £1 million budget which had already been allocated for routine street lighting and maintenance in 2016-2017. In street lighting terms, routine maintenance covers activities such as the repair of outages, underground cable faults and safety defects. At the present time, a full street light and maintenance service is being provided. Repairs are being carried out as normal by the department's external contractors and by transport and eyes in-house operation and maintenance staff. Call Mr. Beggs for a supplementary. Maintenance is a, a basic issue which is required often to maintain issues uh, affecting road safety. Will the Minister assure myself and my constituents that in future the maintenance of street lighting will be something of his uh, initial budget uh, and guaranteed that the items that are failing will be repaired rather than continually seek emergency funding in year? I thank the member for his supplementary. Uh, to go back to the line that I just gave in my original answer, repairs are being carried out as normal. In the last 12 months, my department has received reports of 48,000 streetlight outages. Of these, 42,500 have already been repaired. The number of streetlights awaiting repair is approximately 2%. So we are operating the normal service, uh, and perhaps the member should take stock of the improvements uh, since his party colleague was in position when the grass couldn't be cut and the streetlights couldn't be kept on. Call Mr. Alex Easton for a very quick question to you. Yeah, could I thank the Minister for his answer so far? Um, could I ask the Minister how long it will take to fix the backlog of streetlights uh, that he's mentioned still haven't been done across Northern Ireland? Thank the member for a supplementary question. Uh, and as outlined before, this additional finance enables us to run the maintenance service up to the end of the year, where those 2% of street lighting uh, will be dealt with in adequate time. 
That ends the period for listed questions. We now move on to 15 minutes of topical questions. I call Mr. Colum Eastwood. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And can I join with others in congratulating uh, the Minister and welcoming, welcoming him to uh, the House to take questions? We're told, uh, Minister, that tomorrow the Queen will travel by train to uh, Ballerina. Uh, is she not coming to Derry because of the dilapidated nature of the railway station there? thank the member for his question and for his welcome. Uh, the member would need to get in touch with the Queen's Diary Secretary to find out why and what reasons she is travelling to a particular place. Mr Eastwood for a supplementary. Maybe, maybe you can give me the number. Uh, the, uh, thank the Minister for his answer, I think, but he hasn't really addressed uh, the fact that our railway station in Derry is in a dilapidated, a dilapidated state. I'm disappointed today that he has rejected the idea of a halt at the uh, city of Derry Airport, and lots of other people will be disappointed as well. But can he today give some level of commitment that we will have, once and for all, a proper fit-for-purpose railway station at the old wa Waterside Railway uh, Station site? I thank the member uh, for his supplementary, um, and perhaps to, to correct him, uh, I didn't reject the idea of a halt at Derry City. I said it was something I'd be remiss if I didn't look into. Uh, I think Hans Hart will uh, correct the member on that. Uh, my department remain in negotiations over the purchase of a particular site. Uh, it would be wrong and remiss of me again as, as Minister uh, to come down on one particular site or the other. Negotiations are ongoing. Um, but I remain uh, committed to the transformation uh, of the transport network in the North West. Uh, we are going to see a 21st century transport hub developed in, in Derry. Uh, and I am committed to that despite the fact that uh, the recent vote uh, on a Brexit does make uh, investment in a lot of our projects across the north that little bit more difficult. But certainly under my watch, uh, a transportation hub in Derry remains a priority. Call Mr Paul Garvin. I thank the Minister for his answers thus far. And just in relation to uh, the claims, uh, and I appreciate that there has been money allocated out of the June monitoring round to deal with uh, road maintenance. Has he any idea how much we, the department are currently paying out in claims for potholes in rural roads? I thank the member for his question. Uh, I don't have that detail uh, in front of me. Uh, due to the economic times in recent years, our resource budget and certainly that into maintenance hasn't been what we have wanted. Uh, so, uh, no doubt, the, the claims uh, are higher than we want to pay. Uh, since coming into post, uh, I have had a focus on, on the need to, you have mentioned rural roads in particular, to look at a rural road network, uh, and it is something that I hope uh, that this can be addressed with an initiative uh, in the very near future. Mr Garvin, for supplementary. Th thank the Minister, and I appreciate that uh, I am a great believer in a stitch in time can sometimes save nine. Uh, if it is identified that we are expending a large percentage of our budget uh, to uh, pay out on claims, will there be an opportunity to reprofile for next year's budget to ensure that there is a greater emphasis put upon uh, maintenance as opposed to claims? Thanks for, for the member supplementary. Uh, and you're right. Uh, it is the case that you know, when we in invest money into fixing potholes, uh, it is money, while it's needed for road safety concerns, that is not the best way to spend it. Uh, the stitch in time is definitely the best way to look at this. Uh, and if we in any way can increase uh, not just road maintenance but road resurfacing in a more strategic <coughs> fashion right across uh, our network, including our rural roads, I think that would be the benefit to us all. Call Mr. Jerry Carl. Uh, thanks, Mr. Speaker. It was briefly referred to earlier, but I would like to ask the minister: Would he agree with me that the real danger posed by climate change represents a big threat to our environment, uh, including the coastal lanes? And uh, would the minister share the concern that I would have, along with many others who are worried about the environment and the uh, the real threat to our coastal lanes posed by cl climate change has? I thank the member uh, for his question. Uh, indeed, this is something I have spoken with officials with since coming into post. I, I do share <coughs> concerns. Uh, I believe, I, I, and, I, and I'm not up to date with the, all the science in this regard, but despite the fact that sea level is rising very, you know, incrementally around Ireland, 
It is a case that the Earth's crust is also slightly rising, which is buying us more time, perhaps. But it is an issue, you know, be it Belfast or the, the west of Ireland, this is an issue that we need to grapple with. This is an issue that this executive and the Assembly needs to take control of, uh, and we need to do so in a more strategic fashion. Well, Mr. Carl, for a supplementary. I thank the Minister for his response, and would he agree with me that it's concerning, uh, given the scale of the risk uh, mentioned, uh, posed to coastal lines and the danger that this uh, does represent? Uh, the fact that there is not one body responsible for monitoring the erosion of our coastal lines is deeply worrying. And would the Minister support the call and take necessary steps to ensure that there is a single organisation? Uh, set up, um, tasked with caring for a coastline to ensure that the effects of erosion are uh, monitored, and maintained, and uh, prevented. Member for a supplementary, there is, however, an organisation, uh, and it's something that the, the previous minister, Michelle McAlphine, kicked off with the Coastal Management Forum. It's something that I, I am going to have further discussions with her on. Uh, on which department maybe takes the lead or, or has a greater focus. Uh, I actually like the idea of the two departments working together on this. There are infrastructural concerns, but there are also environmental concerns. I think both departments can come together and provide more strategic uh, solutions to the problems. Call Mr. Colin McGrath. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And can I wish the Minister well in his uh, first time here to the House for the uh, questions? Can I ask the Minister uh, what he has done in his department to implement the Downpatrick Traffic Plan? We have been waiting for many years for this, but I'd like to see if there's a time scale for the implementation of it. I thank the member for his question uh, and for indeed for his kind welcome. And can I extend a welcome to him to this House? Uh, as two constituency MLAs, I hope we can work together uh, going forward on a number of issues. Uh, I was well aware of the need for a transportation study uh, before I came into this post, but certainly coming into post is something that has been on my desk. Uh, as you will know, my department has commissioned consultants to review the numerous transport studies carried out over the years for Downpatrick Town Centre, including the Down Council's Town Master Plan, and to advise the department on the best way forward to manage traffic progression through the town. This review has now been completed, and Transport and I has recently undertaken a full consultation process with key stakeholders and two public information events for the general public. I am pleased to advise that all events attracted considerable interest, allowing the Department to fully engage with elected representatives and the public on the various traffic management proposals currently being considered. Full consideration has now been given to the key findings and recommendations of the report and also the feedback received at these events in order to decide how the Department should proceed with its plans to improve traffic progression and road safety in Downpatrick. Well, Mr McGrath for a supplementary. Thank you and can I thank the Minister for that answer. I know that part of that plan was to see a resolution to the problems that there are in Edward Street in Downpatrick and I think that part of the plan was to deliver that resolution as part of the overall plan. But could I ask him to give particular attention to that issue, which sees articulate, articulated lorries on the footpath as school children are trying to get into a primary school, a situation which cannot continue and needs to be resolved long before the implementation of this plan? Can I thank the member again for a supplementary? Uh, and indeed, he's right. Not only Edward Street, but indeed Fountain Street, he'll be well aware as well with the HGVs. Um, and again, Edward Street is going to be key to the solutions going forward. But I, I'd like to give the member this assurance that this is a, a, a very important problem that I want to address in the years ahead. Uh, and again, I'm more than happy to meet with the member discussing this in person. Call Mr. Andy Allen. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And may I take this opportunity in the Minister's first question time to wish him well for his time in office. Minister, in light of the judgment in the court case of the award of the A8 tender in 2009, could he comment on the fact that there has been a breach of Regulation 30 of the Public Contracts Regulations 2006? Can I thank the member for his question? Indeed, is kind welcome. My department uh, were disappointed with the outcome of that particular case, uh, but I don't think it's appropriate to say any more at this time. Clearly there is a serious issue and the public needs assurance that when a government department awards a major contract such as this, the procurement process must be fair and above board to ensure that the facts of the case are understood and any lessons are learnt. Will the Minister self-refer this case to the Northern Ireland Audit Office to investigate and report on? I thank the member for his supplementary question. 
And let me make it very clear, if there are lessons to be learnt in this regard, I will make sure that those lessons are learnt for everybody involved. Um, I am more than confident with procure procurement processes within the department, uh, and I, th I think this uh, is an issue that uh, I will look at again with officials to see uh, what can be gleaned in the short term so that long-term practices are what the public require. Mr John O'Dowd is not in his place. I call Mr Sean Lynch. Good morning, good uh, can call you. The Minister will be aware that serious flooding happened in Fermanagh over the winter months, cutting off communities and flooding roads. Following the June monitoring round, can the Minister give up an update of what he is going to do to fix those roads? Thank the member for his question. I am pleased to advise that funding has been allocated to my department as part of the June monitoring to enable five flooding relief schemes to be delivered in Fermanagh this financial year. The five schemes are the B127 Newbridge Road, Liston Ski, the B533 Wattlebridge Road, Newton Butler at Derry Curb, the C436 Sinish Moor Road, the C444 Boho Road, and the U6525 Wellington Road. The first three schemes are on the key roads from one side of Loch Iron to the other. The other two locations are other routes prioritised on the basis of inconvenience caused. These schemes are considered to deliver the greatest benefit to the wider community. All schemes require an element of design, in particular the highest priority scheme on the B127 Newbridge Road Listening Ski near the Shire Centre, where a piled reinforced concrete slab solution is now being developed. Call Mr. Sean Lynch for a My good and Gorm Wakeston Fagra. I want to thank the Minister and I want to wish him well in his new post. I know the roads that he has been talking about and there have been a major impact when they do flood. Can I ask the Minister, has he a timetable when this work will begin? Gorham Elgut. and thank you for your supplementary question. Uh, access to land will be required in some of the cases, but with the fair wind, I expect that works on the ground will be carried out in the late summer and the early autumn of this year. Mr Robbie Butler is not in his place. I call Mr Trevor Clark. Much, uh, Mr uh, Speaker. Can I ask, and if it hasn't already been asked in relation to the announcement last week in, t in terms of the additional finance you got, well, that will address um, all the road safety issues in relation to grass cutting along the verges of our roads? Well, thank the member for his question. Uh, it enables us to do a second cutting. Uh, whenever road safety comes into uh, view, if you excuse the pun, uh, Everything else is secondary. Road safety is paramount for my department. Uh, while we are looking to do second cuttings, we will cut sight lines and pull sight lines back wherever necessary as often as possible. Mr. Clark, for a supplementary. I appreciate what the Minister has said, but there are many areas at the moment that have not actually had their first cut. Um, so, can the Minister give an outline when his department is supposed to have their first cut finished before they go on to the second, and also when actually the wheat spraying will start also? Thank the member for the supplementary. It is thought that the, the first cut will be complete uh, in the next few weeks. Uh, we've had a period of very wet and hot weather, which is perfect growing conditions, uh, which does uh, increase the amount of time it does take to get around that. Uh, and as far as I am aware, the weed spraying will begin in, in a few short weeks ahead. Call Mr. Raymond McCartney. Can I too welcome the minister here for his first question time? Can I ask the minister? I know he was in Derry recently on a visit and he provided the, the Chamber with a, an update on the A5 and the A6 projects. I wonder if, if the Minister could outline how he sees these uh, projects going forward. I thank the Member for his question, uh, and indeed I very much enjoyed uh, presenting to the Chamber of Commerce in Derry. Uh, it was a very worthwhile um, venture to speak and to give assurance to people of the North West that they will remain a priority uh, going forward and that a priority of mine will be to address the infrastructural deficit west of the ban uh, and going forward. Uh, as, as far as the A5 uh, is concerned, in February 16, the then DRD published draft statutory orders and a new environmental statement for the A5 scheme. Draft vesting orders and direction order were published for sections between new buildings and Ballygolly. The orders for the section between Ballygolly and the border of Ochnacloy are not being taken forward at this stage until we have confirmed details of the link with the N2 of the border. Four public exhibitions on the scheme proposals were held in March 2016, with more than 1,000 registered attendees. My department also received almost 1,000 formal representations on the proposals. A public inquiry to be administered by the Planning Appeals Commission is due to commence on 4 October. The Public Appeals Commission has arranged a pre-inquiry meeting for this Wednesday, the 29th, in OMA. 
The PAC will report on the inquiry around May 2017. Subject to successful completion of all the statutory processes and satisfactory outcome of the PAC inquiry, it is hoped that construction can begin in late 2017. Call Mr. McCartney for a quick supplementary and a quick answer from the Minister. Can I welcome the Minister's answer and can I just ask the Minister is he satisfied that all the funding is in place to allow that project to go forward? I thank the member for, for his question. Funding, like many departments, uh, is an issue that's going to constantly be on the table. Uh, just now, whilst the A5 and the A6 are not heavily reliant upon European funding, Last week's decision is going to make funding a number of projects for my department uh, a lot more difficult than what would have been last week. Uh, but I am content that A5 and A6 is not reliant upon this particular scheme uh, of money uh, and certainly remains a priority for me and my department in the years ahead. Ms. Up. 